We want to welcome everybody into the sanctuary here at FAM Church. Sorry about this morning. Uh, we had a snafu with our audio, but we should be up and running. We welcome you into the sanctuary here at FAM Church. FAM Church, do me a favor, put your hands together, and let's welcome our online guests. <laughs> Thanks. And again, sorry for this morning. Well, Miss Kristen, welcome. Everybody welcome Miss Kristen this morning. Good morning. So today, and all through from Mother's Day to Father's Day, we've been talking about family and all the stuff that goes along with that. Well, today we're going to be talking about family and money. Family and money. So get, get your nerves all tucked in, okay? So let's talk about that, about family and money today, because it is a, um, it's a real challenge for a lot of people. Amen? And let me tell you that at the end of the day, finances in the house... Uh, shouldn't be a problem for Christians. Hello. Let me tell you, Christian people should be the most well-off people in the world. Let me say that again. Christian people should be the most well-off people in the world. Why do you say that, Pastor John? I'll tell you why. Because if you're a Christian, you should be showing up work before everybody else. If you're a Christian, you should be working harder than anybody else who is on the payroll at where you work. You should be the apple of your boss's eye. When your boss gives you something to do, as a Christian, he or she should be able to leave from where you're at and know good and well that that job is going to get done just as good, if not better, than if they were to do it themselves. Hello, is this thing on or ain't it? And so there should be no problem with the people of God in this church, in all churches, climbing the, the corporate ladder to make and earn what it is that you need to make and earn to make a living and to live. That should never be a problem for Christian people. Christian people should be earning money because they're the best employees ever. Period. That's the way that's supposed to be. Unfortunately, it's not that way. How do you know we live in a time where people don't want to work now? Ha <laughs> ha, hello. Case in point, me and Miss Kristen, we got us a little deck built. We want to have us some outdoor furniture, you know. We want to, you know, we want to live, you know, we want to be uppity. <laughs> so we've been looking for some, for some patio furniture. You know what I mean? And so we went over to a big box store, not the one here in town. In another city and we went there and we was trying to find uh, some patio furniture and so you know how it is uh, you go up to the desk and say hey can I get some help over here in the patio furniture area how do you know you you're in for a wait so we go over there and we sit down don't we miss Kristen and we're waiting and we're waiting and we're waiting so perhaps they forgot about us they're busy so you go back up to the desk and say hey look uh, is there a wait maybe y'all forgot uh, we get it you know I'm trying to be nice here I'm a Christian if you will, <laughs> if, you, if you will, if, if, would you call that person again so that maybe they can help us over here with the patio furniture? Sure, no problem. So you go back and you sit down and you, and you wait again, right? Right? I mean, I, and I know, I know what's going on. So the third time I walk back up there, you, you know, I, the Tabasco sauce is beginning to flow a little bit. And, and so um, you walk up there for the third time and, and, you, and, and you ask where the, where the guy is or the girl is. And, of course, they say, well, listen, we're so sorry. We're so sorry. Everybody has called in but that one person. God bless that one person. So you can't bust that one. The, uh, listen, the people who are working right now, okay, how many you know you need to be patient with them? Be patient with them. They're at least trying. They're overwhelmed and overworked, but at least they're showing up. Be patient. At the restaurant, everywhere else, hello. Hello. And so she said, everybody else has called in. So I was curious. I said, so what happens when you call in? She said, well, you just, you just call in and then, you know, you have to call into the manager. And I said, so when they show up the next day, what repercussions are there for calling in? She said, well, there are none. She said, they just keep calling in and keep calling in until the manager fires them. So, 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 so there's a racket going on. So they go in, they get trained, 
And they work one day, and then they start calling in day after day after day after day until the manager fires, and then they can go get on unemployment. See, there's a racket working. So me and you's working to pay somebody who won't work. Ladies and gentlemen, when you take money from people who will work and give it to people who won't, that ain't charity. That's thievery. You feel me? And so, I, I, listen, so the problem, listen, we live in the land of plenty. Everybody who wants to work nowadays, and especially if you're a Christian and show up on time and give it and do everything that you're supposed to do, you can make a good living. The problem is we don't have, okay, a revenue problem. we got a spending problem in the church. you got a spending problem in your house. Me and Miss Kristen got spending problems, hence families and finance. We spend too much money. It's just like Washington, D.C. Hello? They spend too much money. They don't have a revenue problem. They do not. Let me repeat that for those of you in the back. They don't have a revenue problem in Washington, D.C. They got a spending problem in Washington, D.C. That's what they got. And if they don't have enough money, you know what they do? They print more. You know what happens when you print money? You go to prison. You know what happens when they print money? They get reelected. <laughs> Yahoo's. So it, it, it's, it, revenue ain't the problem. Spending's the problem. And so what we got to do in the household of faith is get our act together so we're not spending and living above our means. Now, one of us on this platform was raised with some sense when it comes to finances, and one of us wasn't. I'll let you guess. <laughs> so, Miss Kristen, share with the people this morning some of the things that you saw coming up as how your mom and daddy handled their finances, and then I'll share with the folks how we handled our finances. Go ahead. Sure. Well, he didn't mention that I'm the tighter one in the family, and that um, he, he You're freely... tight? No. <laughs> Yes, just a little bit. In the sense of we don't have patio furniture, and I've been looking for like three months. So, yeah, I'm pretty tight on what we spend our money on. But um, By the way, I'm just like, but let's go. We got other things to do. Yeah. Anyway, so I, I was raised very differently in, in as far as economical status. I was raised in a middle-class family, um, probably pretty in a, in a normal middle class. Um, I really don't know because there wasn't a ton of conversations around bills or finances. Um, my, both of my parents worked and bills were taken care of. I mean, we had what we needed. We didn't have what we wanted. So um, I did observe a lot of, of financial wisdom as a kid in the sense of like we were given budgets and limits as far as what we were allowed to spend um, for vacations or, you know, if you went, you know, we were given... Uh, for back to school shopping, we were given a budget, and I remember um, one year, I think I was around 13 years old, and if you're my age, you remember the store Bongo, which was a very popular store that sold jean shorts and, like, shirts that had, you know, kind of like what they wear today, actually, um, but they were colored jeans, and so I really wanted these maroon shorts and a maroon vest to go with it and um and i i spent most of my whole budget um that year on not even a full complete outfit and so <laughs> i learned a really good lesson from my mom um in the sense of you know how to be a little more frugal because nowadays we would have felt bad for our kids and we probably would have given them a little bit more money to get another outfit or so but that didn't happen in my house that was my budget and that's what i got and I knew very well that was all I was going to get that year. Um, so I did grow up with budgets and limits. Um, and we did have what we needed in our home. There was a, a time that I saw my mom um, leave a job that she really loved to go make more money um, after my parents' divorce because what she loved wasn't going to supply what we needed. Um, so I did see some of those kind of things coming up. But not a lot of conversations just because our bills were paid. Yeah, and, and I was raised up like, what's a budget? What's a budget? What is a budget? Because, I mean, we had nothing coming up. We had absolutely nothing. What you going to budget? How do you budget when you've got nothing? Okay, we're going to take this much money, and we're going to apply it to this. And we got this much money, and we're going to apply it to that. We had nothing. You see, I mean, we grew our own food. 
I was raised without electricity and indoor plumbing. You know, I mean, so, you know, every day I get up and pull the valve and hot water comes in the house out of a pipe, it's a good day. Okay, so, I mean, we raised our own food. Um, we didn't have money to, to, to splurge on anything. I, we had, uh, as I said, our, our garden, we, we, we grew two gardens uh, in the year because the climate I was raised in afforded you that privilege. So we had two gardens, a spring garden and a fall garden. And, you know, we didn't have money for clothes. I can remember putting on a pair of jeans and wearing them to school. And everybody said, he's got girl jeans on. I thought, girl jeans? What in the world? And they had a different, they had a girl thing on the back. I thought, good Lord, Mom, thanks. <laughs> but, you know, we just, didn't, I, we just didn't have any money. And so, uh, you know, we grew our own food. But, you know, the food that we had, I can remember growing up, you know, we had fresh cucumber on the table every night, fresh tomato on the table every night, fresh onion on the table every And Papa had to have bread with every meal. Every meal he had to have bread. So we had a lot of vegetable plates, you know, and we didn't have meat unless we went out and killed it or called it, or clubbed it to death <laughs> in the redneck way, and so that, and, and that's the way that we was, and so, and and so we grew up like that. I, I remember, uh, like for example, at Thanksgiving, you know, Grandma would go buy a can of English peas, okay, and she'd clean, she'd she'd warm up a can of English peas, and I'm like, whoa, English peas, this is so exotic. Because <laughs> we, we grew up on like pink eye purple hull, Jackson Wonder butter beans, zipper peas, you know, all that stuff, you know. We, we got these English peas, man. I thought, man, what, what in the world? And then she'd, those uh, brown and serve rolls that break off into three. Oh, so he's like, man, Thanksgiving is special this year. We are blessed. You know, that was the kind of the attitude that we had. We had nothing. So we didn't have anything to give. Grandma, every now and again, she'd go buy something without my grandpa knowing about it. Because he, listen, if he found out she was spending money or giving money to the church or something, boy, he was livid. So grandma would pull me aside and she, she worked in a sewing factory. She said, now listen, John. She called me John Boy. She said, John Boy, listen, you make sure you're around here when that mail runs today. She says, when the mail runs, she says, I'm expecting a done. Now, my grandma called a bill a done. Anybody call, remember old timers calling a bill a done? So grandma said, um, she said, I'm expecting this done. She said, listen, when the mail runs, you go get it. Don't let your papa know that that done's here. She said, you hide it till I get home and you give it to me. <laughs> I thought, God, this sounds so redneck. But I told her, I said, Grandma, I said, this sounds nefarious. And she said, now, John, you know the Bible says, don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. <laughs> I say, that sounds like that's out of context, but okay, we'll go with it. And so that's just the way it was when I was growing up. Uh, we, you hid things from one another. There was no money. You know, if there was a couple extra dollars, you went and bought Miller Lite with it. You know, because it was time to rejoice, you know, and all this time. We're going to have a party. Old Milwaukee's best or whatever, you know. Some of the nastiest stuff you can ever put in your mouth. And so, but that was the way I was raised. And so how many of you can tell and know that when we got married, I brought all that into the marriage. Kristen bought her fiscal responsibility in the marriage. And now all of a sudden we got fireworks in the house because we're, we're from different ball fields. Man, we, we're not connecting here in this deal at all, right? So we had trouble coming in because we just didn't know how to communicate when it comes to finances. And we, Neither one of us were really taught about it. I, I didn't have any, you know. And so she understood budget, budgets. I didn't know what that was. And so most of the time in homes, if both of you are tight, it'll be all right. Come on. If both of you freely spend, I mean, bankruptcy is in your future. <laughs> right? It's true. But then if, if one of you is tight in the home and one of you spends freely in the home, Okay, now you, now you got fireworks, right? Now trouble's in the house. And so how do you handle that? And so me and Miss Kristen is going to talk a little bit about that today. Now, when it comes to making money, as I already said by way of introduction, most people don't have a problem earning money. And if you do have a problem earning money, okay, go find you another job. No one is sitting there with a ball bat threatening to beat you to death if you leave your job. 
Find you, if you, you know, if, and if you like what you're doing but it doesn't pay, well, then suck it up. Because it's not about you anymore. Hello, especially if you got kids, right? I mean, do you know how many people down through our history, people's shoulders that we stand on, you know how many of them worked at a job they couldn't, they couldn't stand and hated and didn't love for a family that they did love? Hello, let me say that again. Do you know how many men and women worked hard at a job that they didn't love for a family that they did love. So I know you want to be all that and fulfill your purpose and all that, but listen, do me a favor. Go to work. It'll help you, and it'll help your family. And it's good for you to work. Work is honorable. Amen. So you can earn money. The problem is how you spend it. That's the problem. And so... Miss Kristen, in the course of a family, in the course of your human life here on this earth, what's the biggest thing that you're going to pay for? Yeah, well, our house is the biggest thing that, that most Americans pay for. You know, we've got That's to have exactly the biggest, right. the best, the, you know, we have to keep up with the Joneses. Our house has to just be perfect, pristine, and we drop a lot of cash on it. That's exactly right, because we have to have the biggest house. Not the one that we can afford. I want the biggest house I can get. You, you see, that this is the American dream we're talking about, by the way. Let me get the biggest house I can barely afford. We call that house poor. Yeah. So you, you gotta, have to pay so much for your house that you can't afford to do anything else. So you go and, and you, you get somebody to run your credit, and they say, you, based on what you make, you can afford... Boom, this kind of house. And you start looking for the absolute max. And first, right out of the bat, you're in a bind. Because you're not making good sound decisions right out of the gate. Listen, you can't be thinking, all right, I've had my credit run. Here, here's what they tell me I can afford. Let me max that thing out. No, you look at them and say, what's the cheapest I can get out of here with? I mean, you don't want to live with the slums, but, you know, right outside there. I'm being a bit facetious, but you get the idea, right? Because you want to be able, you don't know what tomorrow holds. And if you get into a bind, you know what I'm saying? You don't need to be all bound up with a great big old house payment. It's not healthy. You feel me? Yeah, when we started searching for our house that we have now, um, I mean, they will, they will lend you so much money. We were looking at you like, can you believe they'll let us borrow this much money? Like, no. And we had to be so firm with them. Like, we're not going over this amount. Like, oh, this is these our devils a, amount. So we need a house within that range. And, and you know, um, I'm, we're kind of minimalist in that, in that aspect in the sense yep. of, like, the bigger the house, the more I have to clean. So, you know, I'm looking for something that is going to work. I mean, I'm not going to have kids forever. So, you know, we just need a house that's going to be comfortable for us and live. We don't these, need yeah, oh, this, this, a million these, dollar house. These lenders, they say, are you, what? You, you, but we can give you this much more. This much more. This much more. And I'm like, I'm, I'm like, look, the devil's a liar. I don't need this. You know, I'm not straddling myself down. So, yeah, and so the question now comes, right, as we go into spending, okay, why do we do this? Right? Why do we do this? Why do we feel like we have to build the biggest house that we can max everything out on? Why? Miss Christian, you know the answer to this. Why do we as humans want to want this stuff? Why? Well, we're looking for what other people are going to think about our family. Exactly right. How, can we keep up with the Joneses? Are we going to have what our friends have? What do when they see where we live in our house? It doesn't match up to where they live. And, and that actually causes us to feel bad about ourselves for some reason. Yep. And so one of the, one of the bridges you cross, okay, from being an adolescent to being an adult is that you stop caring what people think about you. Hello? Is that not true or not? That's the, that's the truth. One of the biggest bridges you cross from adolescence into adulthood is you stop caring about what somebody else thinks. Like, I'm going to build my life around what you think. Are you nuts? 
I'm not doing that. I'm not going to live in a particular neighborhood so you think Pastor John's got it going on. I'm going to live a big of a redneck lifestyle that you've ever seen in your life. Because I'm not trying, I'm doing this for me. You see, that this is what I like to do. This is what I was raised. I already tell you, I was raised around getting my own food and raising my own animals. This is what I, this is what I know. You don't listen. You don't have to have a lot for that. But this is what I, you see what I'm saying? I'm not going to live my life. I love y'all, but I'm not going to live my life based on what y'all think a pastor should do. Well, our pastor lives at uh, so-and-so. I don't know. Listen, if you think that, if, that we are going to live our lives like, it's not going to happen. But that's the one of the biggest things. When I take my daughter to school, and I got the radio cranked, okay, and Florida Georgia Line and me are getting with it, and we roll up on the school, my daughter's first thing out of their mouth is, turn it down, turn it down, turn it down. Now, why does she want me to turn it down? She's embarrassed. That is embarrassing. It's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. People's going to know. They're going to hear me, and they're, and they're going to see this car, and they're going to think about it forever and ever and ever, and I can't have that because they're going to put it on social media. <laughs> Rabbit trail. You know how you stop people from putting stuff on social media that, you know, someone wants to, listen, a stretched collar ain't never hurt nobody. The next time you try to bully me online, I will snatch a knot in your rear end. Everybody says, my God, you, Pastor John, you, listen, we didn't have the problems we had 30 years ago when bullies stood up to bullies. And I ain't saying go around slapping everybody, although most of them need to be slapped. But I am telling you to stand up for yourself. And these young people who think they're going to get online and start bullying people, listen, the only thing that a bully understands is the bully. But no, we've been taught now, we've been told, don't, don't stand up to him. You come tell the teacher. You come, come to, listen, I done told my kids, somebody hits you, don't, ever, don't you ever hit somebody first. But if they hit you, you better, not, I mean, you better tear into them. And they said, well, Daddy, I'll get suspended. I said, well, the school may suspend you. Daddy's going to take you to go get ice cream. Because <laughs> I don't play that. I do not play that. That's the problem that we got in this country now is people don't want to stand up for themselves. Again, I'm not, listen, I'm not telling you to be a bully. I am telling you to stand up to bullies. Back on the thing. Turn the radio down, Daddy. Turn the radio down. I'm embarrassed. And, and so we worry about what people think. Listen, if you're physically grown, physically, you're, you're as big as you're going to get physically, and you're still worried about what somebody else thinks about you, look at here, all eyes on Pastor John, including those you are watching. Grow up. Grow up. Quit worrying about what other people think of you. Now, Miss Kristen, because we're running out of time. Right, well, we want to talk about spending on a home, but we also spend uh, frivolously with a credit card, right? And there is nothing, especially as ladies, we like to look nice and, and have our nice clothing. And there's nothing that bothers me more than going to Belk or, or some store like that, and they're like, would you like to put this on your credit card? You'll save 30%. I'm like, no, I do not. And John knows it. He'll look at me. I'm like, no, we are not. I don't want a credit card. You know. I give him my Social Security number. That's true. That's I don't run that thing. I tell Chris, I say, look, it's 30% off. If you'll just pay the bill at the end of the month, that's 30% off. Like 25.7% interest? You can do that, you know. And so, but then it's, you know, but if you don't pay it off at the end of the month, you got trouble coming. No. It's important within your relationship to have these conversations. We can sit up here and joke about it because we've worked these things out in our own marriage, in our own life, and, and being responsible with the money that you have. And can I read this scripture really quick? Yes, go for it. All right. Proverbs 22, 26 through 27. Y'all need to listen up. This is a good one. Do not be one who shakes hands in pledge. Or puts up security for debts. If you lack the means to pay, your very bed will be snatched from under, under you. You hear that? So don't be the one who shake hands. Remember shaking hands? You made a deal with somebody. Now, you know, you have to sign a stack of contracts this tall, right? This thick. Don't be signing contracts pledging to put up all your security and stuff for debts. 
if you lack the means to pay for it, your very bed will be snatched from right underneath you. It, debt is not worth it. Now listen, we do the same thing with cars. One of the worst things you can do is finance something that's going to be depreciating. You're paying more and more for it while it gets less and less expensive. And I get it. we got to have a, a dependable way of going. And listen, me and Miss Christian's in that boat too. But when the, band, when the van broke down and I was driving out of, out of the driveway with the van and it went, bow, and metal fell out from underneath it, I thought, well, that's, 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 I rode this thing as far as it can drive. <laughs> so I had to go get me. So we started looking for vehicles, trucks, 40 grand used. 40 grand used. Well, I, you know, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. So I had to go find something several, 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 several thousand dollars cheaper. And older. And older. Because I'm, I'm not going in debt like that because, again, yes, it's used for by all means. I, because, again, why am I going to be paying more and more for something while it gets less and less? Unless you could uh, avoid financing things that depreciate like the plague, it ain't worth it. People finance computers. Here you are paying a big interest rate on computers. And as soon as you took it out of the store, it starts to depreciate. It's already obsolete. Never, ever, unless you can avoid it like the plague, never, ever finance something that's going to depreciate in value. You'll, you'll, you'll rule the day. So, houses, cars, all these big items, etc., etc., get you, get you into a bind where you cannot and are unable to do anything and you become a slave to the people that you owe. And it's simply not worth it. And it, it affects your relationship and the stress. And it also, there's scripture talk about how it affects you spiritually. Mark 4.19 says, But the worries of this life... The deceitfulness of wealth. And listen, the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Yeah. So all this stuff, I got to have this, I got to have that. It chokes the life out of you. What you need to be doing and what we're trying to do every day is every day live a life that decreases, not increases. Let me say that again. Every day, you need to be trying to live a life that decreases, not increases. Right? Because, listen, it's not worth it. And it does not, it, it gets you into a place to where you can't even help out the church house. Now, Christian and I, we never talk about money. We never take up an offering. You give as you leave. But in the last five minutes that we've got here with one another, let me tell you something. If you will give to God, hear me, and give to God first. I, 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 listen, I can't explain it. And understand, you're not giving to me. And what I cannot stand, tell evangelist, cannot stand them. And I've read, and I, listen, they think that they're going to use God like a stock market. Like you're going to let me get, you give to God and... He's going to, you know, it's a stock market. You're investing in him, and he's going to give you money back, and you're just going to have money over hand over fist. <laughs> I even saw somebody, one of them televangelists one time, sent me a letter in the mail. Down at the bottom of it, he said, people tell me that they get a more return on their money when they invest in this ministry than any other ministry. <laughs> I thought the devil's a liar. See, he's trying to manipulate people into giving. We don't manipulate people into giving. People give. But I will tell you this. If you want God's favor on your finances, give to God first. You say, some people say, well, I, I just can't afford that. Listen, you can't afford not to. Listen, do y'all understand that God's economy is not like the economy of the United States of America? Do you get that? And when you give to God, there are blessings that come from that. And I'm not here to tell you what to give. Not only do we not take up an offering and you give when you will, I don't even tell you what to give. You search your heart and mind and whatever God tells you to give, then you be faithful to give that. And it comes right off the top. Me and Miss Kristen have never had a discussion with one another saying, now, are we going to pay the church anything this week? 
What, are we going to pay? Are we, are we going to pay the church anything this month? We've never had that discussion. You know why? Because we pay. It's not even a topic of discussion in our home. It it just happens. It's not even a. It's not even a thing. It happens. Now listen to me. If you do that, and if you'll mind your manners and do what you're supposed to do and not live above your means and put God first, I'm telling you, the Lord will bless your finances and you will have more than enough. But you can't convince people of that. Because they feel like that they have to give to God last or they don't have enough to give. And I'm just here to tell you, y'all know I don't browbeat you about money. I rarely talk about it. But I'm here to tell you, if you put God first, not live above your means, and do things the right way, God will bless your finances. Anybody who lives that way, shout me down right now. It happens. There's ten times I'm like, how do we make it? How did this work out? Well, the Lord, the favor of God on our finances is the only way that's happened. And our oldest daughter just started to work. Which means she's starting earning paychecks. Hallelujah. Guess what's the first thing we're teaching her? She gives right off the top. Right? That's the way we roll. Our kids are going to do that too. Miss Krista, I don't think you have anything to add about finances in the church, but that's how we have always rolled. I, I would say, you know, the Lord's always faithful, has always been faithful to us when we needed a miracle um, of, in our finances and, and because we're faithful to Him. And so it doesn't mean you're going to, you know, like a televangelist, get a Cadillac or something like that. But the Lord takes care of His people. And, and if you're in a situation where you're struggling and you... Um, you know, you need a financial miracle, pray. The Lord will come through for you. Absolutely. I'm absolutely convinced of that. And that's the way that we live. So again, boiling it all down as we conclude our time together today. Remember, it's not a revenue problem. It's a spending problem. Number two, put God first. If you'll watch what you spend, put God first. I'm telling you, you'll have enough money to make it week in and week out. That's the way this thing Rolls. Amen? Give God some praise this morning in the house. Now, as we close today, Miss Kristen's going to be praying over people in particular, those of you who are watching online as well, for people who are in need of financial help and miracles. And I know that everybody gets themselves into a pinch every now and again. And so I'm going to ask Miss Kristen to pray over you. You don't have to identify yourself for all that because that's not what we're here for. But if you have financial needs today, Miss Kristen's going to pray over you, and I'm going to believe with Miss Kristen. We're all going to believe together that the Lord God will undertake in your finances and turn things around. But listen, you've got to do your part too. One of the hardest lessons you have to learn as a Christian is God is only going to take care of the things you can't take care of. I grew up in Pentecost where everything, we thought God was going to take care of everything. Listen, no, there's some things you're responsible for. God's only going to come to the rescue on things that you cannot contain or control. If you can contain it or control it or do it, you do it. God's in the business of handling things you can't do. So... If you've got yourself into a bind in your finances, we're going to believe God that the Lord will start the process today of getting you out of this mess. Miss Kristen, pray. Lord, we just thank you for today and for the word and, and all that your word gives us. And I pray right now for those who may be struggling financially or need a miracle, Lord, I pray that you give them wisdom right now, wisdom on how to restructure their finances, wisdom on what the next step is for them to be made whole. And I pray uh, for those people who need a financial miracle, Lord, that you will come through, that you'll send groceries or, or money, Lord. I've seen you do it for us, and I know you can do it again. I pray that you... Um, help someone out of a bind, Lord. Help them to have that wisdom and allow us all to work towards financial freedom. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, stand to your feet. Let me bless you. Have a great Sunday, a great day tomorrow. Remember what Memorial Day is all about. Stretch your hands to the heavens and receive this blessing. It's yours as a child of the King. Now, may the Lord bless you and may God keep you. And may the Lord make His face to shine upon you. May God be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance on you, and may he give you peace. Receive that today in the mighty name of Jesus. I love you in the Lord. Go and do good.